Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? Good to see you all. Um, please, there's uh, there's some chairs up here, so if you want to come up, like I say, it's not class. No one will call on you. Uh, there's food back there, so please make sure you get some food. Can everyone hear me in the back? Are we cool? Great. Great. So welcome to What Matters to Me and Why. Uh, really grateful to see you all here today for our second What Matters to Me and Why of the semester featuring Karen, Hub uh, Karen Hubner. We also have coming up uh, Paula Cannon, who's a HIV AIDS researcher at the Keck School, a professor of medicine there, and also the president of the Academic Senate. And Chief John Thomas, who runs our Department of Public Safety, which is the largest one in the country. Um, they'll be uh, in the next two months. So there's some flyers in the back. Uh, we hope that you come back for future events here as well. Normally I come up here and I shamelessly plug a few events before uh, I introduce the student who will introduce the speaker. But I feel like today I'd be remiss if I didn't at least acknowledge how difficult this week has been for so many people on our campus and in our country. As many of you know, an executive order on Friday banned travel from seven uh, Muslim majority countries and stopped the flow of refugees into the United States um, for a certain period of time from all countries. This has affected us dramatically on our campus. Um, we have one of the largest international student populations in the United States, second only to NYU. 11,000 international students, that's a quarter of our population. We have hundreds of students from Iran, which is one of the countries that was on the list. Um, you can imagine how difficult this is for students from those countries. Um, it's already difficult to be an international student on our campus, and this exacerbates an untenable situation. I regularly meet with students from all over the world, and I recently had lunch with a, one of our students from Syria, and she told me that when she calls her father in Aleppo, she just hopes he can, he'll pick up the phone. That's what she prays for. And now she's, in some ways, a prisoner here. She can't leave. So uh, it's been really um, a dark time for our students who are directly impacted from those seven countries. It's been a dark time for Muslim students generally on our campus. Um, it looks like this executive order is targeting Muslims. Uh, it's been a very difficult time for Muslims anyway in the United States after 9-11. And we have at least 1,500 Muslim students on our campus from probably every Muslim majority country in the world. And I think it's been a difficult time for all of us, regardless of our religion or our national affiliation. As a research university, what we do is we collaborate. And we can't do that without freedom of thought or movement. There is no research university without freedom of thought or, or movement. So in many ways, this makes our mission very difficult to teach and learn and research and collaborate, and also to learn and grow and know one another. What has given me light in this darkness is how many in our Trojan family have stood up for our students, regardless of their political affiliation or preference of candidate. People from all over the world have been writing in. All of the Trojan family has really opened its hearts to all of our students. There's a Facebook page where Trojan parents are opening their homes to our students. People of different faith traditions are coming together to support our students. I think it's brought out the best in the Trojan family. And uh, that's something that we have to remember. In order to learn more about these issues and to support our students uh, as we think about what this means, and no one really knows what it means right now, um, we're going to do several events this week, and I would love to see you at. Tonight, we're going to do a teach-in at the United University Church, where we learn more about the issues, the executive order, and how that impacts people on our campus. Tomorrow, Manuel Pastor is hosting a panel discussion uh, at 4 p.m. at THH 201, talking about the immigration implications of this executive order. On Friday, students are hosting a rally against the ban, against the wall, 11.30 a.m., uh, Tommy Trojan. So if you would like to participate in any of those, please come. They're all free and open to the public. So with all that being said, um, and I'm sorry to start on that note, but like I said, this is something that's really on a lot of our minds and in our hearts right now. Um, all that being said, you know, one of the great things about this series is that it provides an intimate space for us to reflect upon meaning and purpose and significance, the fundamental issues that make us human. And in some ways, this series has never felt more urgent than it does right now. 
And one of the reasons the series is such a success is because uh, we have students pick the speakers and we have students introduce the speakers. So I'm really grateful to introduce uh, Nikhil Mishra Bumbry. He's a junior history major here at USC. He's really a member of the Trojan family. He grew up in it. His father, Arvind Bumbry, is a professor here in the Marshall School of Business. His um, mentor is Karen Hubner. He's worked very closely with her uh, over the last several years. So please join me in welcoming to the What Matters to Me and Why stage, Nickel. It is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Karen Hubner, the director and co-founder of USC's Polymathic Academy. The one word to describe Dr. Karen Hubner is polymathic. She's an international tennis champion, a scholar in history, and an entrepreneur who helped build a really new innovative program at USC. I must say that I am truly blessed to have had her as one of my very first professors at USC. She helped me develop skills and confidence that prepared me for my undergraduate career. My initial meeting with her was at a Starbucks in Pasadena to learn more about her class, LA, a polymathic inquiry. I immediately felt like I was becoming part of her family and I knew that a unique, one-of-a-kind relationship had formed. This class of hers is no ordinary college course. You have the opportunity to learn in a unique, hands-on, engaging way. Imagine getting an education by taking a day-long trip to Disneyland and by kayaking down the LA River. Bet you don't get that anywhere else. She's a real gem who is an amazing educator and a truly genuine down-to-earth person who has unusual dedication and commitment to her students' academic success in her class. She devotes lots of one-on-one -on -one time to guide each of her students. I worked on a paper on the development of Little Bangladesh, a small ethnic enclave in LA. Initially, it was just planned to be a class assignment, but when we found I needed to gather more information, Dr. Hubner had me go beyond the secondary sources and seek out primary sources. This involved contacting and talking to advocates from Bangladesh and Korea who were essential to the foundation of Little Bangladesh. And now Karen is having me work towards publishing my paper. She is a knack for unleashing the true potential of students. In addition to being a wonderful academic mentor, to me she is like a family member as she spends endless amount of time advising me about my personal life. We have discussed numerous matters involving my personal decisions and my relationships with others. I will always treasure her words to me. Once you were my student, I am always your professor. Even when you are 50 years old, I am still your professor. Connecting with Dr. Hubner is a sure way to make your experience as a Trojan unique and memorable. And with this, I proudly welcome Dr. Karen Hubner. Well, that was really touching. It's, uh it came right from Nikhil's heart, and let me get this out because I prefer to sit if that's okay with you guys. Um, I do want to say about Nikhil's work, uh, it is profound, it's so profound that his project inspired a whole new dimension of our class for this year uh, in connection with the library it was a, a whole new project on researching neighborhoods in Los Angeles, which then inspired a whole conference that we're going to hold in the spring on uh, writing small books about neighborhoods in Los Angeles. Because believe it or not, what Nikhil pointed out in his research is that the library is, is really, um, there's a dearth of material on neighborhoods in Los Angeles, really important neighborhoods like uh, Chinatown has some, but Little Tokyo doesn't have a lot um, of material to access. Little Armenia, um, all the little neighborhoods around LA, Venice Beach. Uh, so, so all these, uh, this project that he did last year has really inspired uh, major, major new projects uh, on Los Angeles. So he's he's really contributed, and he is um, a very, very dear 
student to me and will be, like I said, when he's 50 years old. So, <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I'm here to talk about a few things about my life uh, to, to hopefully inspire you. And I have three stories I'm going to tell. And they're based in, in that Pauline uh, verse uh, in Corinthians, that is, 1 Corinthians is sort of used and spoken at weddings and funerals and, uh, you know, faith, hope, uh, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Um, I'm going to tweak it a little bit. Uh, but the, 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 so I'm going to tell three stories based in those three principles and, uh, and then open it up to questions and maybe comments uh, in, uh, from you about those, those three uh, principles in your life. So the first uh, is faith. Uh, it's not, I'm not talking about, in this story, faith uh, of, of belief, but um, sort of walking in faith. So I was a tennis player. I don't know if you know, that was my first passion in life. My first uh, half of my life was about tennis, and I played since I was three. I aspired to turn pro, and when uh, scholarships were available at UCLA, I'm sorry, my, both my parents went to UCLA. My mom was the head pep girl. My dad was the captain of the tennis team there, and I just always dreamed of going there and playing tennis there. And so when it came for me to do my recruiting in my senior year in high school, I played you know, all over the nation as a young, a young person. Um, of course, my first choice was, was that other school. And I've been here, by the way, uh, like four times longer. So I'm, I'm, I'm totally Trojaned out now. So. Um, but, but then I really wanted to go there. And uh, I got a scholarship offer from Stanford. I got a scholarship offer from Cal. I got scholarship offers from Florida. And, uh, but I was just so, I was so disappointed because UCLA didn't have any scholarships available. All eight of their players, they have eight scholarships, uh, were staying. They were all coming back. And uh, so it comes, comes to springtime my senior year. Uh, it happens to be my birthday, uh, March, blah, blah, blah. So you know, <laughs> uh, March 23rd, actually. And I'm having dinner with my parents. And I'd already done the trip down to UCLA and, and I heard the disappointing news. Well, I got a phone call from the coach at UCLA who uh, I, I, I thought she knew it was my birthday, but she didn't. And she asked me, have you decided where you're going to go? And I said, out, I just blurted out, yes, I'm coming to UCLA. And she said, well, I'm really happy to hear that because uh, our number one player just turned pro and I have a full scholarship for you. And so I, I look at that moment as a step of faith. I really took that step of faith in that moment, and uh, much to my parents' uh, you know, happiness, but also I didn't even consider <laughs> that they'd have to pay for my school uh, going to UCLA. But, but that was a moment of faith, and I, uh, a step of faith. And uh, I can't tell you how many times that when you've worked so hard for something and you really have that passion for something, you know, take that step. It may not always, you know, turn into that full scholarship, but I can't tell you how many times that step of faith has blossomed into something because it's, it's, it, it's inside of me, and it was, it was something I'd worked towards it. So the second story that I'm going to tell you is about hope. And fast forward, finished my career in, uh, prof professional career in tennis, and I uh, was teaching tennis, I was coaching tennis, and I was in a rut with my life. And I, I'd majored at, at UCLA in history, my passion. I loved history. And I'd always aspired to go back to school um, for my PhD, but I'd gotten into this rut in life. And I was about 34 years old, and I was playing softball. I was, I was playing softball on a co-ed team, and I hit a pretty good ball. Uh, tennis players have good hand-eye coordination. So I, uh, and I was, I, it was kind of like that thing, I could make it home if I really trucked around third base. So I trucked, I just went so fast, and I, I had to slide into home plate. And I, uh, my cleat caught a, a hole in the plate, and I, I got a, I had a spiral fracture. I heard it. It was loud, and I was safe, so that was good. But um, I was, uh, I was, grounded basically for five months. I couldn't even put my foot down because the spiral fracture doesn't allow you to put weight on your foot or your, you know, because it would, it would, it's not a clean break. And, um, and that 
that five months was the best thing that ever happened to me because I, I, I really, at that moment when I broke my leg, I knew it was a profound moment. And I, so I thought about what do I really want to do with my life? I can't play tennis right now. I can't coach tennis. I can't make my living. I'm just stuck. And I decided I'm going to go back to graduate school. I'm going to, I'm going to do what I always wanted to do. And, and then that, at that moment, um, I realized that hope that in that way is, is, out, is about perspective, right? So I, I took a bad, challenging moment in my life that could have been really devastating uh, to my livelihood, to my career, and, it, and, the, and hope became perspective. So I, I re revived my hope in, in a dream that I had to go back to grad school. So fast forward... Um, I said it was hope, uh, faith, hope, and love, but I'm going to change love to time. Time. So I'm a graduate student now here. I'm so happy to be here. And uh, I got assigned to be a TA for Kevin Starr, 2006, which was right in the middle of my preparation for qualification exams. I don't know if anybody knows what that means, but it's, it's the most challenging part of your graduate school um, you know, path. So I was assigned to Kevin Starr, who I don't know if you have heard of him or um, know of him, but the most prolific writer on our campus. Um, and you only know the books that he published, but he published hundreds of books other than the ones that were published for. He published the history of USF, of Loyola Marymount, of countless high schools, of libraries, of across the United States. He just, he was such a prolific writer, and um, we just, we just lost him two weeks ago. However, 2006, I come into his office to meet him as his new teaching assistant. He goes, you're not a teaching assistant, you're my teaching fellow. He, he, he always would elevate. So he was telling me about the class that I was going to help him with, California history, and, you know, I'm looking at my watch. I got, I got to get back to my qualification exam uh, studies, and I've got papers to write. And, and he said, would you like to go to lunch uh, with me? And I said, um, sure, okay. <laughs> I've got so much to do, but I, I didn't say that. But I said, I, yeah, absolutely, let's go to lunch. Well, that hour turned into weeks, and that weeks turned into months, and months turned into years. And he was the busiest man I've ever, some of you guys know who know him, truly the busiest man I've ever known in my life, a busiest human being. But he was the type of person that would, with you in the moment, you were the only thing in front of him. And, and interestingly, uh, Dean Sony had mentioned that in the, in the email to me this week about how sorry he was with, with Kevin Starr's passing. And he said it was the time that he gave you that meant so much. And um, he, he had a way of, of just, it, even not with me, I'd watch him with, uh, you know, someone we'd cross the campus, he'd, he'd come across his path and he'd, he'd stop. Even though he had something he was going to, he'd stop and ask them how they were. And I got, got letters, emails from students after he passed away that, um, he remember they, you know they remembered Kevin stopping and talking to them on, on McCarthy Quad. So the time that Kevin gave me was a, a form of love that he gave me, and so my you know faith, hope, and time, and the greatest of these is love because that's what time is when you give your time to the person, you hold the door open for the person coming um, behind you, or you wait for a person when you're in the car to cross the street instead of, you know, or acknowledge anybody uh, coming across your path to, to just give them that moment. It, doesn't, it can be a moment, it could be years. And, um, you know, I cherish the time I spend with Nikhil. It's, it's been um, the best investment in time that I I've, I've, can make. I, the time that Kevin invested in me became 
the academy. We, we ended up um, partnering up for that uh, five years later, he, he said he, he wouldn't take the, the chairman or the directorship without, without me by his side because the time we had established together um, was such a, a, a strong investment of trust. And, and so um, that, that's, that's the, the message of, 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 my, of my life, of, of faith. Take those steps of faith that are, come in moments. Those are moments. They're not constant. Um, you will have those. And I, if you have any, I'd love to hear about those moments of just taking that step of faith that you've, you, you know, maybe it brought you here. Um, and, and that um, the hope when things are, are really challenging or, or have had um, on the first look a, a, an, a, an impact, a negative impact, hope can change that perspective as it did for my broken leg. I still have a, uh, uh, I have pins and plates in my leg that, yes, we did go to Disneyland on Sunday from the class and I couldn't actually walk the next day because of this broken leg. But it reminds me of, of how it was such a transformative moment in my life. And, um, and I think hope did that for me. But time is the greatest of all these. The time you give to the person in front of you um, is, is the greatest of all three. And so I just wanted to say one last thing about that verse, that Pauline verse, um, when, it, when, it said, when it starts with what love is, the first phrase is love is patient. And patience is your time that you're giving to that person. And that is, that is love. So faith, hope, love, and the greatest of these is love and your time. And thank you for your time. So I'd love to take questions, or I'd love to hear about your faith, hope, and time moments. If you have any that came to mind when I was uh, talking, um, you know, these principles are, are life-shaping. Life so anybody have? Yes, sir. Yes. Hello. Was there ever a point where you didn't quite see um, a hopeful future uh, after the injury, like at least initially? Any like, oh gosh, what am I going to do? Yeah. Well, those five months were a gift, and it and uh, when I was in the hospital that night, uh, and they said I had that um, injury. Basically, what it meant was I had no more money coming in. I, what am I going to do? You know, what ca so there was panic, and it's I'm not superhuman. You know, it just was. But the five months were a gift, and I, I knew it was a big moment. There's no question. Especially as an athlete, I have a new friend Sam here. He knows he's an athlete. Uh, when you're an athlete and you have an injury, I'd never broken anything in my life. I'd never had an injury as a tennis pro or player. So it was that was big just being injured. Um, but I knew, I mean, I, I have the picture. It was 7, uh, 7.15 on October uh, 18th that I was sitting on the table in the hospital and I knew it was a big moment. So then I knew I had to think about it. But yeah, I was scared, very scared. But it, perspective, you, you know, you, it takes time to kind of move it a little bit. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Any more, any thoughts? Anybody have a, a faith moment where they've taken a step of faith based, based on, you know, long passion, desire? Um, I mean, how'd you get here maybe or? Thank you so much for your mm -hmm. <clears throat> beautiful words today, comforting and healing. Um, I had the good fortune of doing a the program review for the Harmon Academy, oh, right. and in my uh, conversations with people who worked in the academy, um, the one thing that was constant was the students' um, admiration and love for you uh, as one of their most important mentors, not just inside the classroom, but outside the classroom. I think that was what we saw with Nikhil and certainly what you experienced with Kevin. I do find the best mentors on our campus are people who are there for their students in all aspects of their life. In some ways, they're almost like chaplains, not just professors. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about 
more specifically about mentoring, um, and you touched upon it in terms of what Kevin meant to you and what you want to do with your students, but um, for those of us who work closely with students, maybe um, a philosophy of mentoring that you found helpful or meaningful. Yeah, um, the first first thing that comes to mind is uh, unique, be uh, you know, uniqueness to each student and each each person. That there's no set template to apply to a student. That each student has unique desires, ideas, and if if so, listening really carefully and getting a feel of their. Um, of their heart and their mind and their passions and desire. So I never, I never think that, I, you know, I, I, have, I have a student here, Blake. Blake and Nikhil are so different from one another, so makes, I, I, just, I just come in fresh and, um, and very open. And also, I mean, I, I learned something I never knew before from, from Blake that and in the conversations. So... And and uh, and you already heard about what I've learned from Nikhil, so that um, humility too. That I don't I don't know everything by any means, and I can learn. It's an exchange. It's not just a one way relationship for sure. And that's how Kevin and I were too. And that actually builds a lifetime of 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 mentorship and collegiality and friendship that can become family. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Sam. I just met Sam. <laughs> He's a tennis player. <laughs> yes, Karen, I have a question. When you uh, first became a teaching assistant with Mr. Starr, I think his name, yeah. When you, when you first started with him, was he aware in terms of where you were coming from, in terms of obviously the five months had just happened? and you were transitioning and how that would have affected your relationship or even your ability to do the work that you were assigned to. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, he was, he, he had done his research on me, so he knew I was a, a tennis player. And, and, and so another thing is that um, my tennis career, I graduated from the, the other school in 83, way before any of you were born, and uh, except maybe you. And, uh, and so 83, I didn't go back to grad school till 99. So there was a 17 year hiatus there. But he had done his research uh, and he knew I was, I was a tennis player and he, he did that very thing of my uniqueness. He said, you know, you're a, um, an older student and he, oh, don't take offense at this, but you are a little, he had this amazing voice. You are older than most of the other graduate students and that's a plus. So he actually um, recognized you know the the uniqueness of what I brought to the table and encouraged me to um, to use that uh, uniqueness and so um, and he knew he knew that my physicality I, I recovered from my broken leg before you know well in advance of my working with him but he knew that uh, athleticism and physicality was still really um, critical to my identity and my, who I was so you know, we, we, uh, he, he honored that. He honored that. And, um, and I wanted to say that, too, about, about time. Uh, time, investment in time is, is important in yourself as well, you know. Um, meditate, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a meditator. And, uh, when I, and, and it's so important. It's alone time. It's not just about time invested in others, too, but invested in yourself as well and I, I, I didn't want to neglect that. It's it's critically important to to your wholeness. Um, so there's a balance there. And uh, so thank you for that. Yeah. Thank it, you. Yes. You can I can hear you if you Yeah. I feel very fortunate, and it's a serendipity because I came here just to do my own work, and this happened, and I'm also a doctoral student here at Price School. I didn't have, I wasn't fortunate enough to cross paths with um, Dr. Starr, but I have many faculty members at Price School who, who, are, who are remembering him very well. But um, 
I'm also a very newly minted TA. I'm taking my quals in the summer. Oh, so nice um, yeah. your talk was, like I said, it was a very serendipitous moment. I feel, I think it might be a calling. But um, I don't know. Like I, I think the greatest struggle as a doctoral student is like I'm constantly trying every day, balancing personal and I call this professional in a way it is a job and also not to lo lose sight of my purpose why I came here. So I if you if 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 you could like could, could you share maybe some moments of struggles that you had while you were doing your doctoral studies and how you managed to stay foot, you know, and not lose track? Sure. Yeah, and it would be different for everybody cuz a different but if you find that that you in it that's really important. So I'll tell you what I would do. So um, I, uh, I, wa I, I, I didn't even have a computer when I started grad school. Isn't that sad? I didn't even know how to turn one on. I didn't know how to use the internet. It was 1999. I hadn't been in the academic world for 17 years. I just read books. That was it. Those hard things that we used to read. And, um, so, uh, I was way behind and I had a really steep learning curve. And uh, so when I would write a paper, I just didn't think I could. I mean, you know, we have to write 30-page papers in grad school. Like, I never wrote anything close to that in undergrad. And um, so what I would do is call upon my, m what I was, f where my strength was, where I, my familiar strength. And so I would go to the steepest, longest hill I could find in LA. This Temescal Canyon was this one down by the beach. It's two miles long. And I would, r I would run it. And I'd tell myself, it was this challenge, if I can make, make it to the top without stopping, I can finish my paper. Totally incongruent. It just like didn't make sense, but it was my strength, the will, that sense of, I don't know if you've read that book, Grit, but I did just read that book, Grit, and uh, the speaker speaks about calling upon that will or that grit in you. And that's where I found it. Um, and I, and I also uh, didn't let competitiveness with my other students get in the way because I would share my, you know, thoughts and, and get students, uh, like-minded students that would share, be able to share and bounce ideas back and forth and so try to let go of that competitiveness. And that, that's kind of counterintuitive with being a competitive athlete, but I learned that working together only... And it's a lonely life being a grad student. It's it's very lonely. So if you can find that network or, and uh, you know, come to my office too. <laughs> I'd love to hear what you're working on. I'm in the library, second floor, two forty one. Okay. <laughs> so, had a cup. Hi, Karen. Hi. I I know so much of your work in the academy is a little bit. Um, it's it's not as tangible a lot of the time. It's very um, conceptual. And so I just wonder if you can maybe relate how some, and a lot of times it's academic discipline related. So can you talk about how it's kind of, how you, you've seen it either affect your life personally or you've seen it impact students' lives? So you can kind of take it from, so a lot of theoretical discussion right. to actual like practicality or application. Yeah, the academy, I don't know if uh, you've, been to some of our polymathic pizzas or uh, quadrant series or whatever. They're, they're places where students and faculty come together to just test run ideas and think about something around a, a targeted topic. Um, but what I've, so you're all welcome to come and there's free food too, always. Um, <laughs> but uh, what I've really uh, think of almost the most valuable part of those sessions the, the intellectual part's awesome, but the freedom to think freely, that sounds uh, uh, redundant, but the freedom, to, the freedom and the space to think freely and test run your ideas and engage one another, uh, myself with students, students with students, fa the faculty guests with students, is, is an exercise. And it, 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 it's, it, there's no grades, there's no pressure. There's respect there. We've never had any kind of disrespectful moment in seven years of, of it's so organic. And so that, that freedom and organic part of it is, is, is I think the most valuable thing that students take away. 
and faculty. Faculty tend not to think organically in, in a weird way. They'll, they, they're, you know, want organization and, you know, lecture, or what, a lot of faculty. But where they get in that environment to just, you know, anything goes. We have a topic, tonight's topic, we have a polymathic pizza tonight, by the way. Uh, it's on translating. Um, it's with a, a Portuguese, Spanish and Portuguese professor, but it's about translating a discipline across disciplines, like how do we listen to one another? How does an engineer listen to an English major or hear or understand the, the, the lexicon of, and just that exercise of, of engaging one another and, and, and it being organic. I have no idea how the conversation is going to go. We just have a professor talk for 15 minutes and then students pop questions like you do and then it just goes in its direction. So I love that part of it. It empowers you. It empowers the students, and um, I love to watch. I'm just, I just, uh, yeah. It's been such a rewarding experience for that, for that reason. <laughs> yeah, Katie. <laughs> you mentioned. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you mentioned three main principles in your mm -hmm. talk. Um, which I really appreciated. So I wonder if you might share one more that you find has been a theme mm -hmm. throughout your life. What would that be? Okay. Um, I just went with the first word that came into my head <laughs> because it is a real principle that my, uh, my mom and dad gave me, and I wish we had this principle today more in place across the world and in our administrations and our political leaders. But... Um, it's kindness, and k kindness to whoever comes across your path. And it could be a moment that you'll never see that person again, but that moment of kindness to that person is, is, is your calling as a human being, you know? And so I think I have this, I've always had this image of kindness. I, I, I don't know, I got it when I was like eight, and it's, you, you have a pond, and you throw a little pebble or a big pebble, it doesn't matter, but those, those uh, centrifugal waves go continuous all the way till the end, because um, that's what happens when you throw a pebble in a pond. So the pebble can be big, or the pebble can be small, it can be a stone, it could be a boulder, but it still will you know, reach out way past the point of contact in the pond. And that's my image of kindness. That's, that's, if I had to tell a metaphor for kindness, that's the kindness. And so I'm not always kind, but it's always on my mind. And it's a line for a song. <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Any other thoughts or you want to break? And, and uh, some of you probably have to get on to class. And, um, but I'll be here for uh, another... 15, 20, 25 minutes if you'd like, because I have to eat lunch. <laughs>